So in this lesson, we're going to look at the properties of rational exponents. So the properties of rational exponents are exactly the same as properties of regular exponents. It's just that they're a little more complicated because now instead of working with whole numbers, we're going to be working with fractions. So if you look down through your examples, all the rules are still the same. When you're multiplying, you add your exponents. Power to a power, you distribute or multiply that power in. So when you have a negative, it still goes to the denominator of your fraction. All of these rules are still the same, but if you look in your examples, say you have 5 to the 1 half times 5 to the 3 halves. You're not going to multiply those bases together. You're not going to make it 25. What's going to happen is you're going to keep the base and add the exponents. Just like if you had x squared times x cubed, you would still have x to the fifth. It's just that because these bases have numbers now, it messes with your head a little bit. So my advice to you guys is really to honestly, if you're stuck on a problem, make a similar problem that you do know how to do and go from there. So let's look at some examples. So we've talked about these properties before with products and quotients. So we'll just address it one more time. Depending on if it helps you, remember that you can either put two items that are under the same radical as two separate radicals or vice versa. Take two separate radicals with the same index and put them underneath one. Same thing goes with division. So if it helps you, you can separate them into two or one separate radicals if they have that same index. So a radical with some index n is in simplest form. Remember, if the radicand has no perfect nth powers as factors. So that just means no perfect roots underneath. And your denominator has to be rationalized. So that means for here, denominator has to be rationalized. That means no radicals in your denominators. And that's no, nothing new. We've talked about that before. So moving on, we're going to look at multiplying some of these expressions. So let's look at number 1. 12 to the 1 eighth times 12 to the 5 sixth. So in order to work with fractions, we have to remember our fraction rule. So if we want to be able to add our exponents, which are fractions, the only way to add fractions is to have like denominators. So we're going to keep this base of 12. But what common denominator can 8 and 6 go into is the question. So I always start with a larger number. And if I'm thinking of multiples of 8, because the lowest common multiple is the same thing as the common denominator, we have 8, 16, 24, 32, 40. Now, you could keep going, but the lowest one that they're both going to go into is 24. So to get to 24, we would have to multiply 8 by 3. So we just have to remember that we can't just say, oh, well, we want the denominator to be 3 or be 24 and multiply by 3. We have to multiply the top and bottom so that it's equivalent to the value of 1. So 8 times 3 would be 24, so multiply your numerator. Over here, 6 times 4 would be 24. Multiply your top and bottom. So we've got 12 to the 3 24ths times 12 to the 20 24ths. So now that they have like denominators, now we can add them together and get 23. And we can't have exponents that are fractions, so we're going to rewrite this as the 24th root of 12. Maybe write that a little smaller. To the 23rd power. Denominator is index. The numerator becomes your exponent or your power. 
So same exponent rules, it's just that your exponents are now fractions instead of whole numbers. So for number two, we've got a power on the outside. So just like what we've done in the past, we're going to distribute that three in there. And remember, for working with fractions, it's just better if everything is a fraction. So I'm actually going to make this three over one. So when you multiply fractions, tops with tops, bottoms with bottoms, so we're going to end up getting 5 to the 3 thirds times 7 to the 3 fourths. So 3 thirds is just 1. So 5 to the first power, and we're just going to rewrite 7 to the 3 fourths in radical form because we can't have an exponent still in rational form. So that's it. So similarly, similarly, for number three, we're going to distribute that negative one six. So again, I'm just going to make these six over one. So we get. 2 to the negative 6, 6 times 4 to the negative 6, 6. So 6 over 6 is just 1. So we can't have exponents that are fractions or negative. So at this point, both of our fraction or both of our exponents are negative. So I'm going to go ahead and put them both in the bottom of a fraction and make it 2 to the first and 4 to the first. And 2 to the first is 2, 4 to the first is 4, so 2 times 4 just becomes 8. So we've got 1 8th as our answer for that. So in simplest form when there's no perfect roots underneath the radical, no exponents that are negative, no exponents that are fractions. So why don't you guys try number four, and I'm going to go over here and do number eight, or number five. So this is the one where I'm going to put them together underneath the same radical since they have the same index. So we need to figure out what 12 times 18 is, and it's 216. Now in this case, the cubed root of 216 is actually a perfect cube. And if you look on your power sheet, you guys should be able to see that the cubed root of 216 is just equal to 6. Six times six times six is 216 perfect cube.